Mr. Honda, we need to talk. I think we have a problem with your V-twin, V4, and inline four high performance engines. I mean, does this look right to you? I think I'm developing a love-hate relationship with my VFR 1200. It is the only VFR currently in my garage after owning a half dozen VFR 800s. This is the 1200 I picked up a couple of years ago on the cheap. I spent some time servicing the bike and riding it close to 10,000k. Unfortunately, I can't ride more than one motorcycle at a time. And if you follow the channel, you know I have more bikes than I can ever ride and a reluctance to part with them. My VFR 1200F was a bike that I wanted to own for a long time, and although it does a lot of things well, I'm at the point where I'm not sure I want to keep riding it. There are a lot of nagging little things that still bother me about this bike. First, it's heavy to maneuver, just wheeling it around, and I dropped it while unloading it from my shop hoist in the garage a few months back. Although the heaviness goes away when you're riding it and it does handle well, it's awkward and top heavy when standing still. The fairings. The latest generation Honda fairings are difficult and cumbersome to remove for maintenance. Sure, they look futuristic, but will provide enough frustration to keep owners going back to the Honda dealer for servicing and buying these tiny rivet clips, which Honda puts in weird, out-of-sight places on this fairing to ensure there are no visible fasteners when looking at the bike. However, the more times I remove them, the easier it is to remember where the f*** all these are and to mount the side panels with the least number of missed attempts. Honda owners with this style fairing you know what I mean. The brakes are mediocre at best. After rebuilding the calipers and front master cylinder, I still don't understand why they're not razor sharp. I'm going to chalk this up to the link braking system, which introduces complexity into the hydraulic system that's neither needed or wanted. Funny, my VFR 800s never suffered from this issue with their linked braking system, but they had a proportional control valve that you could bleed air from, linking the front and rear calipers. The VFR 1200 uses the ABS modulator and something Honda now calls a a delay valve to link the front and rear calipers. The new delay valve was only used on the VFR 1200F and X and the ABS pump in my bike was only used up to the 2014 model year and again not in any other bike. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. All these things aside the bike has developed another issue that may or may not have been there previously. Often when your motorcycle has a slowly developing problem the rider won't notice it until they have something else to compare it to. This is what happened to me when I bought my Kawasaki ZX-14 last year. After riding the ZX-14 for a few weeks, I took my VFR 1200 out and realized the 1200 had a lot more engine vibration at idle and low RPM when compared to the ZX-14. This is counterintuitive in my way of thinking, since a V4 design should run smoother than an inline four-cylinder that has to use balance shaft to smooth out vibration. To investigate further, I removed the right case cover where you'll find the crankcase and ignition pickup pulse generator and rotor assembly plus the clutch and also to get visual access to the cam chain tensioners, which are known and let's face it are weak on the 800cc VFRs. But the 1200 uses a completely different design. Now there isn't any online history that I could find of these cam chains failing on the VFR 1200, but I read that other VFR 1200 owners were having this vibration issue that seems to appear at about 30,000 kilometers of use and the cause was not successfully diagnosed. What I did find under the right crankcase cover was something that has left me a bit uneasy. I mean, does this look right to you? This is the chain that drives the VFR's oil pump, and this design is used in almost every inline and V-twin or V4 Honda motorcycle. This exact chain is also used on the CBR600RR, and some of those bikes I found develop so much slack in their chain that it hits the engine case and makes a ticking sound when idling or cracking the throttle open. In other motorcycles, I didn't find any late model failures, but I did find a number of oil pump drive chain failures in Honda ATVs, and although the part numbers are different, it's not any less comforting. I had to know for sure, is this chain the problem? And if it's worn, well, how worn is it? Will it fail the next time I crack the throttle to pass someone on the highway, or will it just flop around in the engine indefinitely? I posted a video and questioned a VFR forum I subscribed to, but no one really knew. And a VTR owner said his bike looks exactly the same way. So the only way to truly find out is to replace this system and see if it corrects the problem. Now, here's a list of parts I'm replacing, and I'm pretty much doing everything everything since I can't see several of the parts without taking the bike apart further to try to determine what exactly is worn and what isn't. These parts are not expensive. 
The special tools needed to remove and reinstall the clutch hub cost just as much as all the oil pump dry parts. And like I tell my wife, a new tool for the garage is an investment, not an expense. So let's get into it. After draining the engine oil, I removed the side case cover and bolted the CKP sensor from the case. This generation of engine from Honda does not use a gasket. Instead, it just uses RTV silicone sealant when mating the surfaces. This makes cleanup of the cases pretty easy. On the crankshaft drive sprocket, you will need to align the primary drive gear teeth before removing the clutch basket. Rotate the engine. Now, be sure to turn the bike over clockwise only from the right side of the engine until the primary drive gear threaded hole is at about the 7 to 8 o'clock position. Once there, you you can install a spare 6mm button head bolt. Tighten the bolt down and to hold the gears together. This will make removing and reinstalling the clutch ring gear easier. Next is to loosen the nut on the oil pump. Don't take it off all the way just yet. Just break it loose now or you will struggle later on with nothing to hold any tension against it. Now I can remove the clutch. The VFR 1200 and CBR 1000 clutch are very similar and use a large snap ring that holds the clutch rod and lifter plate in place. To get the snap ring off, you will need a solid set of appropriate pliers. Below the snap ring is a seat and once they are out, the lifter plate clutch rod and joint can be removed. The lifter plate has a bearing in it that I will inspect to make sure it is spinning smoothly with no burrs or discoloration. Now I can extract the clutch lifter rod and joint. These are two separate pieces and try to keep them together so the rod goes back in the bike in the same way. Inspect the lifter rod for excessive scoring since the rod is connected to the slave cylinder and you want to make sure there's a proper seal between the slave cylinder piston and the rest of the clutch. Now the first of two special tools are needed, a 12.30 millimeter socket to remove the clutch basket lock nut. I'm going to use my pneumatic impact gun to remove the clutch basket lock nut. If you don't have an impact and are using a breaker bar, you will need to use the second of two special tools, a clutch hub center holder, which is a Honda part. This special tool can be used on either the VFR 1200 or CBR 1000. I found an aftermarket version on eBay at less than half the cost of the Honda part, and there's a link to it in the video description. I will need this special tool to reinstall and properly torque the clutch basket on reassembly anyways. This lock nut is sacrificial and you should not reuse it. Make sure you have a replacement from Honda at the ready. Next out is the clutch spring holder, as well as the washer that resides between the lock nut and spring holder. The outer spring seat I just leave attached to the spring holder so it doesn't go missing. The springs, of which there are two, and then the inner spring seat. I'm also just leaving it in the clutch pressure plate so it doesn't go missing at reassembly. The whole clutch now can be removed as one assembly, and if you're not replacing the clutch discs, do not pull it apart like I'm doing here. But since I'm replacing the clutch friction and dry plates, I'm removing the old discs and judder spring and judder spring seat from the back of all of those discs before removing the clutch hub from the bike. On the transmission shaft, you'll find a large needle bearing the clutch hub spins on, and it needs to be inspected for wear or anything out of the ordinary, like fatigue to the roller cage. If you're in doubt about this bearing, replace it now. Now. With the bearing out of the way, we have a full view of the oil pump drive gears, chain guide, and chain. There's no tensioning adjustment on the chain guide, and it's locked in place with a cutout on its backside and a boss machined into the engine case. So you can't manually tension the chain to take up any slack. Now the bolt on the oil pump sprocket can be removed. This is why it was important to get it good and loose with the clutch still in the bike, since the only way to prevent the sprocket and chain from moving with the clutch out is to hold it with your hand. Don't drop the oil pump sprocket bolt into your engine, or you'll have to go fishing with a magnet. The pump sprocket will now slide off the pump shaft and out from the drive chain. With the oil pump sprocket out, the transmission shaft, drive sprocket, and chain can be removed. The oil pump chain did not appear to suffer from any stretching, as I had originally anticipated. Instead, I found wear on the drive sprocket with the teeth worn and the pitch between the teeth definitely narrower when compared to the new sprocket. The oil pump sprocket also showed some signs of wear, but not to the degree of the clutch hub drive sprocket. Of course, the chain guide also needed to be replaced, but again, I did expect to find more wear than I actually found on the original guide. To reinstall the chain guide, high heat red thread lock should be used and the bolt secured to 12 newton meter or nine pound feet. With the chain guide back in, the new sprockets and chain can be installed. Start by draping the new chain over the drive sprocket. Make sure that the cog bosses on the drive sprocket face outward. They need to engage with the clutch basket when reinstalled 
or your oil pump won't work. Now the new oil pump sprocket can be looped into the chain and installed on the oil pump. The sprocket has a mark on it that says out on the face to ensure it's installed in only one direction. The sprocket is key to the shaft when it slides onto the oil pump. The oil pump bolt and washer can now be installed. Again, high heat thread lock is desired, but it's not possible to torque the bolt just yet, so tighten it up as best you can. Now some oil can be applied to the chain, sprockets, and chain guide to ensure these parts are not dry when the bike is restarted. I'm applying oil to the clutch basket needle bearing before putting it back in the bike as well. I then installed the clutch basket onto the transmission shaft, since I want to make sure the oil pump gear bosses were properly seated into the basket. To do this, I gently turn the oil pump while sliding the clutch basket into place. You will feel the bosses slide into their slots and then resistance on the oil pump chain. The hub ring gear and crankshaft drive gears will also be sitting flush if the basket is properly installed. Now we can get back to the oil pump sprocket bolt and torque it to 15 newton meter or 11 pound feet. The clutch now can be reinstalled, or in my case, rebuilt with a new friction and drive plate set. The Honda OEM plates come in a sealed bag, pre-oiled, but the shop manual recommends an additional soaking in oil prior to install, so that's what I'm going to do. Assembly of the clutch on this bike is best done on a bench, starting with the clutch center hub, and then the flat judder spring seat installed first, then the judder spring itself between the flat spring seat and the first friction plate. The conical shape of the judder spring should face outward against the spring seat, while the raised inner circumference of the judder spring should rest against the first friction plate. The friction plates on the VFR have a designated order, with the black friction disc being installed first. A steel driver plate, then the first of seven blue friction discs alternating with steel drivers. And then finally, the green outermost friction plate. Honda actually sends these plates in order, so they should look like this when you take them out of the plastic. Bag. To help with installation, try to keep the colored spines of the friction discs together when assembling them. It's not necessary, but this way you can see the discs are installed properly when they're in the bike. About halfway through the disc assembly, you'll need to switch to the pressure plate side. Remember the first friction disc to be installed on this side is the outermost green disc, and then the remaining steel and blue spined friction discs. Once all the discs are mounted, the two halves of the clutch hub can be put together and held in place with some spare 6mm bolts until the hub is in the clutch basket. To start, we need to install the distance collar, which is a big washer that sits between the clutch basket and hub. Sliding the hub into the basket will take a bit of effort to align all the friction discs in the deep tangs of the clutch basket. The hub has to mesh with the transmission shaft, so you may need to rotate the hub slightly to get it to seat into the shaft while continually adjusting the friction discs so they align in the proper tang on the clutch basket. Now remember, the last friction disc, or the green outermost disc in this clutch, is rotated and offset into the shallow tangs of the clutch basket. This is done to reduce clutch chatter. Now that the disc and clutch hub are in the clutch basket, those 6mm bolts can be removed that helped hold the clutch together during installation. Next to install is the clutch spring seat, which sits inside the pressure plate, and then the clutch springs. The outer spring seat is slid over the spring holder, and it can then be installed on the transmission shaft. Now it's time to install the clutch hub washer and that new locking nut, with the collar of the nut facing outwards. Using a special clutch holder tool made it to a half inch breaker bar and some raw muscle, the locking nut can be torqued to 186 newton meter or 137 pound feet. After the nut is properly torqued, the collar can be staked in the transmission shaft slot provided with a punch and a hammer. You may need to rotate the shaft by turning the engine over clockwise using that socket again to get the transmission slot in the 12 o'clock position to make this task easier. Now a little oil can be applied to the clutch release rod and some grease applied to the rod joint where it slides onto the shaft prior to reassembly. Install the rod in the bike and then the lifter plate, clutch lifter seat ring, and the retaining snap ring. When installing the snap ring, you may have to push on the lifter plate to get some clearance from the clutch release rod and slave cylinder. And when you install the snap ring, make sure the open ends of the ring are not aligned to any of the open slots on the hub. 
the last step is to remove the button head bolt I installed on the crank drive sprocket, again making sure it doesn't fall into the engine. New RTV can then be applied to the engine case and the CKP sensor reinstalled on the case if you removed it like I did. I found this easier than trying to unplug it from the harness since the connector is not in an easy to access location. The sensor only goes in the case cover in one direction, so pay close attention to installation and make sure the sensor is sitting down into the tapered holes with the wiring harness behind the sensor. The bolts for this sensor should be installed with thread lock and torque to 12 newton meter or 9 pound feet. After refilling the bike with oil and checking for leaks, the only thing left to do now is go for a quick ride. Well, it's a rare warm spring day in March and it's been a few months since I finished the repairs on the VFR and this is the first opportunity I've had to ride it. The question you're asking yourself is, well, was all this work worth it? The answer? Probably not. The bike feels smoother at idle and low speeds, but some bikes are just buzzier in the handlebars and seat than others, and that's what happens at high RPM on my BFR 1200. Certainly not as smooth as my ZX-14. My recommendation then is if you're going to replace the clutch discs on your Honda, replace the oil pump drive sprockets, chain and chain guide. Now these parts are relatively inexpensive and changing them is a really good idea, I think. If you don't change them, it's probably not going to be catastrophic for your engine, but it is going to get noisier as these parts wear and with something as crucial as the oil pump, I mean, why would you take chances for a hundred bucks in parts when you're already in the side case changing the clutch? I still think it's a bit of a flawed design from Honda though, based on the bikes that I've seen with higher mileage than mine, but what do you think? Does what you've seen here shake any of your confidence? Oh yeah! Well, drop a comment below, let me know, and until next time, be sure to ride safe.